Uh, This morning, I I want to begin uh, by, I suppose, setting out a definition, and a a definition of sin. So this morning, I want to set out, start with a definition of sin. Now, why, why, why go there? Why begin like that? I suppose for two reasons. Um, One, we simply don't know who joins our live feed at St. Peter's, uh, do we? In a way, it's quite an exciting thought, but we have absolutely no way just now, you and I, of knowing uh, who's tuning in. And isn't it fair to say, I suppose, that generally speaking, the world has an insufficient appreciation or understanding of sin, a vague, incomplete understanding of sin. Certainly, that's the case with some of my, let's say, unbelieving friends. You know, if we talk to them and to ask them, what's sin? What is sin? The answers would be vague, grey, incomplete. What's sin? And we get answers like, well, sin stuff to do with maybe sex outside of marriage from a Christian perspective. That's kind of sin. Or sin, ah, sin, gross acts of violence. You know, my friends would come back to me with, sin is murder. That's it. Leave it there. You see, it's incomplete, it's vague. So that's one reason to begin here. There's another reason too, because quite simply, is it not quite good for us, for you and me, to be reminded of our fallen nature, to be reminded about sin? Yes, it is absolutely humbling for you and I to think about it, but it's also a really helpful thing for the people of God for us to be face-to-face confronted with our fallen nature, what this is that we do, who we are as sinners. It can be helpful for you and helpful for me. So, you ready? This is the definition of sin. Now, I'm tempted to sing it. (laughs) I'm tempted to sing it because my children know a very cheesy song that includes this definition. Shall I sing it? No, don't worry. I will not put you through that, good people. No. Uh, This is the definition. This is uh, Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, question 14. Some of you probably know it. Let's see if we can get it. What is sin? Please hear it. Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Can I say it again? Let's grab it with both hands. Sin. What's sin? Sin is any want of conformity to transgression of the law of God. Do you see how far-reaching it is? Sin is any way in which we are not conforming to godliness. That's staggering. Like sin is, is any way at all in which we're, we're, we're breaking that, that bar of, of God's law. And if you hear that, as soon as you hear it, what happens? If there is any semblance of honest self-evaluation in your heart, what do you know? Do you hear that? In any, any way in which you don't conform to godliness, what do you know? I have sinned. What do you know? You have sinned. What do we know? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we begin with a definition of sin. But ultimately, why, why, why go there? Why begin there? Because this morning, after a little bit of a break, we're coming back today to our sermon series, this brilliant Old Testament book of Joshua. And in particular, this morning, we come to this figure, this man, this bloke. Did you get his name? We come this morning to Achan. Achan. And as we do this, I think what, what happened, a couple of things will happen. First, what Scripture will do is really reveal to us, show to us the gravity of sin. Doesn't that already stand out to you in this chapter? We'll see here the severity, the seriousness of the sin that is flowing through our lives and that we take all too often, way too lightly. It's the first thing that'll happen. The second thing I think that'll happen is that we will be at St. Peter's this morning by this text, given reason to rejoice. Even here, and isn't it a dark portion of Scripture in a sense? Isn't it? But even here, we'll be given reason to rejoice as we can reflect on the rescue from sin that you know, Christian friend, that I know all in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you haven't already, let's make sure that we've got 
a copy of Scripture in front of us. Let's have Joshua chapter 7 open. And let's notice together, first of all, excuse me, (coughs) that sin brings consequences for the community. Do you get it? Sin brings consequences for the community. Okay, when I was about 17, 18, 19 years old, around that stage, I drove uh, my father's bright blue Ford Orion Ghia. And I drove it into a lamppost. <laughs> it was not a good day. It was not a good morning, I tell you that. If you've ever driven a 1980s Ford, you know they can be stubborn beasts to get going. But it coughed and it spluttered. But eventually, we got some momentum as a young man behind a wheel of a car tends to do. Got up some momentum and then I have no idea what happened, probably not concentrating. And all of a sudden, you know, Andy meets lamppost and we grind to an abrupt halt. Okay, that's me and the Ford Orion. In a sense, though, isn't that what's happening today with the people of Israel and the conquest of the land? You think about it for a moment. If you think back to Genesis, the people have been given a gift from their father, not the keys to a car. But they've been given the promise of a land. And you're with me when I say that it's taken a little while for that to get going. You know, we've had the coughing of Egypt, had the spluttering of the wilderness wanderings. But wait a minute, as you and I, over the last few weeks, have kind of got into Joshua, are you with me that momentum it's kind of been built up in this conquest of Canaan, hasn't it? I mean, we crossed the Jordan, didn't we? And what we saw the taking of Jericho. What happens today? In this very peculiar defeat in a place called AI. I, AI, don't know. Let's go for AI. In a place called AI, this defeat, the conquest grinds to a halt. The people of Israel, they hit a lamppost. Now, Let's ask what and then why. So what happens? Would you look with me to verse 2? Let's all look at this. Look at verse 2 with me. So after, do you see it? After the success of Jericho, the people of Israel, they want to carry on this conquest. So their plan, let's get the plan right. Their plan is to move on through the center of the land to take this place called Ai, which was incredibly strategic for the conquest, because it was up in the hill country, but it doesn't kind of go according to plan, does it? Despite not facing a particularly formidable foe, the people of Israel are routed. Now, you could say to me, Andy, look at the big picture here. You know, there's only 36 people. Out of all of Israel, only 36 people are killed. But do you see it? Look at the end of verse 5 here. Look at how it leaves them. Like they are bewildered. They're fearing the shame of their, their enemies. They're confused. Look at the phrase though. That's got to ring bells for St. Peter's. Does it look? They melt away. Do you remember? That's the expression that's supposed to be used for the enemies of God. You see, this is a catastrophe here. So that's what happens. Why? Now, Let me just take a little breath. Let me put this to you. Don't shout out your answers. But why are they defeated at AI? Why? What's your solution? What's your answer to that? Do you go along the line that so many people seem to go down that the people here are just simply too presumptuous? You know, uh, the ark isn't specified going up with them to AI. Joshua doesn't even seem to go up with them to AI. They don't seem to be crying out in prayer. They're just too presumptuous. Is that the conclusion? Is that what we say? Well, look at verse 1, because verse 1 gives you the answer. Look at this. Why are they defeated? The reason for the defeat, listen carefully, is the sin of Achan himself. That's why the chapter begins this way. The reason the defeat is the sin of one man. Now, do you notice what he does? He steals some of the devoted things. You can remember back to Jericho, can you? The harem, 
Do you remember the stuff, the, 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 the good stuff that was meant to be given over to God? Achan steals it in verse 1. This causes God's anger to blaze, to burn against whom, against all of the people. Let's make sure we get it right. Why is Israel defeated? Why did they hit this lamppost? Because one of their number has sinned and sinned against the Lord God. Now, we have to apply this, of course, and I think, quite honestly, that lesson should be really clear for, for all of us as Christians, but I would be interested to at least see your response through your masks. See, I think the, the lesson that we've got here is that our individual sin, our personal sin, can genuinely have grave consequences for the other people in our lives. Our sin, think about it, our sin, unaddressed or unconfessed, can have serious con spiritual consequences, physical consequences for the people we love dear, the people in our lives, the people in our families, the people in our churches and the, our, our spiritual community. I wonder what your response is to that. I really do. Because you know as well as I do, we live in the most individualistic society, don't we? You know, Dundee, Scotland, the UK in the 21st century. In fact, you know what? The Western world in the 21st century. Who's king? The individual is king. Forget about community. The individual is king. That affects us. So the temptation can be to dismiss this chapter, this lesson out of hand. You could be saying to yourself, Andy, no way, <laughs> not a chance. Okay, this is, this is fine. You know, okay, Joshua's sin affects the church and the community. Not, not today, man. You know, like this is, this, is, this is the New Testament age. This is just an Old Testament lesson. But is it? I mean, in 1 Corinthians, why does Paul instruct the church to expel the moral brother if it is not to protect the people of God. Ah, uh, we know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Come on, we do, right? We know that story well. Strikingly similar to, to this. In that New Testament story, why does God so punish Ananias and Sapphira? If it is not partly, at least, to protect the church. Do you, do you see the lesson? Our sin. It's a scary thought, isn't it? Our sin, our personal sin, our individual sin. If it goes unaddressed, unconfessed, it can spiritually affect our families. Us happens with Achan's family. It can affect the community. It can affect the church. And should we not, you and I, take this seriously? Like, after all, as Christians in Scotland, are we not nearly asking the same question that these people here must have been asking after this defeat? As Christians in Scotland, are we not asking, Lord, why don't we see more spiritual advance? Are we not asking that? Why are we seemingly, as a, as a church, as, why are we hitting a lamppost? Why are we not enjoying more victories in G, for Jesus in Dundee? Well, could it be part of the answer is that our sin, unconfessed, unaddressed, is contributing to our lack of success? Second thing we see here is that sin requires wrestling with God. Sin requires sincere wrestling with God. Um, wh what do you bring to church each week? What do you bring with you uh, to church? As you're leaving the house, you gather stuff together. In addition to your family or who you go with, what stuff do you bring with you? Probably most of us take some way of accessing a copy of scripture, I would hope, either on your phone or something, or, or a Bible. Uh, we do that. Others take uh, a notebook, maybe, take notes or to draw a picture of the preacher. <laughs> that, that could be it. Most of us will take a mask to church, right? We, 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 we do that as well. I want to suggest this morning, I want to suggest something else. As we go through, as a church, as we go through books of the Bible like Joshua, I want to suggest that what you do as you leave the house is you open your back pocket and you put firmly in your back pocket 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. And I will tell you why 
that is. Why is that important to take? Because there we learn something absolutely amazing. (laughs) It's a mind-blowing verse. There we learn that the events, listen to this, the events surrounding the land, you know, the the Pentateuch into Joshua, the events surrounding the land, there Paul tells us those things happen, wait for this, those things happen for us. Isn't that amazing reality? Think about how privileged we are this side of the cross. That these things that we're learning about, you know, you go back to Deuteronomy and Numbers, these things we learn about, they happen for our edification. They happen for our instruction. They happen as examples for you. Isn't that not amazing how privileged we are? Now, nowhere in this chapter, I think, is this more relevant for us than in how Joshua responds to this defeat. So you're with me? I want you to think about, and I want you to notice how Joshua responds to this defeat at AI. So can I ask you all to find verse 6? Let's look to verse 6. Have we got verse 6? Now, before you read it, just find it. Before you read it, remember this critical detail. Joshua doesn't know about Achan. Is everybody with me? This point in time at verse 6, Joshua doesn't know about Achan. Yes, he knows that God is displeased. Yes, Joshua knows it's about sin, some sort of sin. Of course, it it must be. But Joshua doesn't know the specifics. And here at verse 6, he is so confused. He's bewildered. So how does he respond to this? Let's look at it now. Let's look at verse 6. Let me point out a few things. I want you to notice, you'll see it straight away, what he does with his confusion about sin. Do you see what he does? He takes it, where? To God. Do you notice? He falls to his face, where? Before the ark. So that's the first thing. He's confused about sin. He takes it to God. Keep looking, though. Notice how sincere this man is before God. Look what he does. He tears his clothes. There's another act. Do you see? He puts dust on his head. Now, I think as a congregation, we'll know what those acts symbolize. Don't we? Tearing of clothes, a dust on the head. What's that? That's, what's that? It's grief, isn't it? That's he's, he's the actions of being bereaved. You see, he could not be any more sincere before God. Here. But then notice verse 7. Look at the language. So what he does is he models his prayer. Maybe you can recognize it. He models his prayer on Moses' earlier words in in Numbers, crying, Lord, why have you done this? Why have you brought your people to this point? And then the last thing to note is in verse 9, look at the basis for his appeal. He said, Lord, act, please. Please do something. But look at the basis. Act for the glory of your great name. Now, you stick with me, please. I sincerely believe that the contours of that prayer from Joshua, the contours of his response, should, could, should find their way into our devotional lives even this week. Did you hear it? The contours of that prayer should find their way into our devotional lives this week. Because let's call a spade a spade. It's not just as Christians in Scotland. It's not just corporately that some of us are despairing or confused about a lack of spiritual advance, is it? I think it's probably the case in the room for some of us. Individually, it is true. That individually, spiritually, although it is not the case, it feels as though we have hit a lamppost. Like some of us, you know, spiritually, we can look back on great, exciting times of growth. Can you do that as a Christian? I'm sure you can. You look back on times where you were growing in knowledge and you were thriving. And let's be frank about it, you were rejoicing and there was genuine joy in Jesus Christ. You were growing, you knew it, you were advancing. But for some in the room, some of us, we just feel as though we're just looking back on that. And at the moment, there just doesn't seem to be that spiritual advance. And let's be frank about it as well. Is that, if you're in that situation, is it not very often just plain confusing? Like we're not moving forward as we want to do or think we ought to be, but we just don't know why. Yes, like here, we know it must be about sin in our lives. This is what the hindrance is, the obstacle is. But what does sin do? Sin hides itself from us. Sin deceives 
us, we're left confused. So should we not do as Joshua does here? Should we not even this week cry out to God in sincere, biblically rooted, God-honoring prayer? Because after all, did you not see what happens in verse 10? In verse 10, God answers his prayer. In verse 10, not only does God reveal to Joshua the sin that needs to be addressed, but God even reveals how it is to be addressed. Isn't it marvelous? So I suggest to you what we do is we go out of the room, we go home, we go in our back pocket. This week we take out 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. We remember this. We learn from this example, and in our confusing stagnation, apparent stagnation, we cry out to God. So sin sin brings consequences for the community. Sin also requires wrestling with God. But thirdly, sin necessitates a savior and a savior from God. I was listening to a sermon a couple of weeks ago about 10 days ago, and it was a sermon. I just picked it out of the blue, as you sometimes do. And it was a sermon um, on Noah um, and the flood. I'm sure you know the story. Uh, A sermon on Noah. And at the end of the sermon, the preacher did something really interesting. The preacher uh, listed what he could see as uh, parallels between Adam in the garden, and Noah and the situation. Everybody got me? So parallels between Adam in the garden and Noah. Okay, parallels. Now, I'm going to just mention a couple. It seems like I'm way off on a tangent, doesn't it? But we'll, we'll bring it back around in, in a moment. So Adam and Noah, you can see some parallels, can you? Both men, Adam and Noah, worked the ground, did they? Adam, the gardener. Noah, farmer. Adam and Noah... Both were fathers of three named sons, deliberately pointed out to us. See, obvious one, obvious one. Both Adam and Noah were almost, almost like figureheads at the beginning of a new chapter for humanity, weren't they? So Adam, obviously, with creation. Noah, after the flood. What does everybody know? What's, what's the big one? Adam, both Adam and Noah fell into sin. Wait, though. Isn't it interesting to consider that both Adam and Noah were enticed by fruit? Um, Adam, the the fruit of the tree. Noah, fruit of the vine. Both Adam and Noah fall into and know the shame of nakedness. Adam and Eve, of course, in the garden. And and Noah exposed before his sin. Son, do you see you have this deliberate parallel? Don't you? Deliberate parallels. You have two men. You've got Adam. You've got Noah. The beginning of this new chapter with God and both of these men bringing sin, bringing corruption, and bringing it to others. Now, it does, of course. It seems like I'm a way off on a, parallel, uh, on a tangent here, but is there not something similar here? Now, you think about this chapter. What's God doing at this point? this point we've got to, God's revealed there is a specific sin, hasn't he? And what begins is this massive game of, it's almost like guess who? Do we know? Isn't it? Do you see what happens? What God does, he takes all of the people and he whittles them down and he does it stage by stage in order to expose and identify this one guilty part. Did you see how it plays out? You did, didn't you? Come on. All of the people there. And then isolated is the tribe of Judah. You've got them. You can imagine being amongst the tribe there. It's a bit of a worry, isn't it? And then from the tribe of Judah, whittled down to the, what is it, the clan of, what is it? I'll get the name wrong. Zerahite clan. And then they're panicking. And then it's narrowed down further to the family of Zabdi. And eventually, eventually, imagine all the people looking on. And eventually, Achan alone is in the spotlight. Now, this is the point. At that, imagine the tension. What does he say? Look at verse 21 with me, please. Look at verse 21. What does Achan say? Find it. Yes, he admits 
Do you see, he admits to stealing silver, gold, and a robe, but wait a second here. Look at the verbs. What are the verbs? See if they sound familiar to you. Achan says he saw, he coveted, and he took. He saw, he coveted, and he took. Is it ringing any bells? Of course, now, these are the same verbs as used in, in, in the garden. What the author is doing is sending us back, in a sense, to Eden. Do you see what's going on? Is the message not clear? As it was with Adam, as it was with Noah, so here, as the people of God, remember it, they enter into the sanctuary by the eastern entrance for this new chapter, this new stage with God dwelling with him in the promised land. And what happens? What happens with Achan? Failure again. Again, one man sins. One man sins and brings more horror of sin, brings more corruption. Don't you see that lesson? No matter how many new starts fallen humanity receives, no matter how many chances we have as fallen humanity, no matter how many chances we receive, if we are left to ourselves, we will always fail God. As you look to Joshua chapter 7, again you're confronted with the truth. We need not just a savior, but we need a savior from outside ourselves, from outside of fallen humanity. And because of that, do we not, at St. Peter's, rejoice <laughs> this morning? Because what do we know has happened? We know that when the time's fully come, God sent forth his son. God provided a saviour, the saviour that we need. And consider what he has done, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the story. When the Lord Jesus Christ, our representative, when he was in the promised land, he faced satanic temptation. In fact, you, you know the story. He was taken up, wasn't he, to the pinnacle of the temple. What was he shown? Was it just a silver and a robe and shown a, a, nice, a nice robe here? No, he was shown all the riches of the world. And I ask you, did Jesus Christ see, covet, and take? No. The Lord Jesus Christ he stood firm. The only silver that played any role in his life was, of course, the 30 pieces that saw him betrayed. The only luxurious robe was the one that was thrown over him by mocking Roman soldiers. Look to Jesus Christ and what do you see? You see at last a savior, a representative for us and one who has secured by his perfection a sanctuary, the sanctuary of heaven above and secured it for the people of God. So we've seen that sin brings consequences, it, brings, it requires wrestling, it necessitates a savior, but very, very briefly and in conclusion, we have to know what you already saw in the chapter, and that is that sin leads to judgment. Sin leads to the judgment of God. I may be on my own with this, and I'm going to embarrass myself. It's one of those things where you, sort of, you confess your sin as you stand in front of the congregation, and then there's blank looks, and you realize that maybe it's just you. Um, but when it comes to reading a large portion of God's Word, that's when I'm acutely aware of my limitations. Do you know, oh, at least please tell me you know what I'm talking about. But in devotional reading, you know, you read a couple of, a couple of chapters of Scripture and you're kind of, if you're like me, you can't take it all in. And sometimes it's, it's one theme that sticks with you throughout the days, one part, one element of it, the God, you hope, lays it upon your heart, you chew over it, you can't take it all in. There's one abiding impression if you're in a big portion of Scripture. Maybe it's just me. If you are like me, and if you have one abiding impression of Joshua chapter 7, is it not the majestic, pristine holiness of the God that we profess and worship at St. Peter's. Is that not the abiding impression you have of this chapter? His holiness. He's the maker and creator and sustainer of all things. And think about the lengths that he goes to to identify Achan. I mean, he must be concerned for sin, right? And then you, you, you think about this as well, the fact that he will allow his people to be shamed 
by their enemies, all in order to expose and have this sin dealt with. Or even this. I mean, the fact that God would give over such a long part of his word here to this, is it apparently insignificant moment where somebody steals a coat? You see God, the holiness of God. He is a God who is genuinely, truly concerned with sin. And that's a problem. Because how did we start out this sermon? We started out with the sheer fact that you're a sinner. And I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. And, and yes, Christ has come and Christ has lived representing us. He's secured. He has earned heaven. But wait a minute. What about our sin? What about all the sin that we have done? Look back at your life. See the wickedness. What about that? Are we not to face the judgment of, of a holy and righteous God? Well, there is something wonderful for the people of God in this chapter, and it is right at the end of the chapter. So I urge you, as we close with this, would you please look right at the end of Joshua 7. Look at right at the end of it. So you look at, if you see verse 25, Achan is now killed, isn't he? He is punished, isn't he? Achan is killed. Verse 26, read on, you see that a monument is erected to warn the people of God. But just read on a moment. This is my question for you. Are all the people of Israel punished? When you think about the flow of the story, Achan has sinned, he's brought corruption, brought displeasure, they've seen this, this defeat. My question is, are all the people of God killed? No, what do you read there? Look, then, then, Achan is killed, then the Lord has turned from his burning anger. I hope in a... In a way, you're filled with joy. Do you, do you see what you have there? You are face to face with an eternity changing principle. Your God is not like the supposed gods of Rome, the supposed gods of, of Greece. The anger of your God, do you see it? It is not capricious. The anger of your God is not just voli volatile, it is not arbitrary. What do you learn there? What is the eternity changing principle? That if a suitable punishment is found for sin, if a suitable punishment is meted out for sin, then rejoice. The anger of God is satisfied. The anger of God is turned away. It is propitiated. And we are about to sing. <laughs> and we are about to sing for the first time after a sermon in here. Very, very long time. And are you not given reason to lift up your voice in song to God from that eternity changing principle? Because, what do you know? You know that this episode with Achan, it points you forward from him. Doesn't it? This, this episode with Achan, it points to you to the cross. And what happened there? That there another representative he stood before God, another man on behalf of all of his people. One from the tribe of Judah stood before God and he faced punishment for our sin and at the cross. What do we know? The Lord Jesus Christ, he turned the Father's wrath away from us and don't dare have that as an, just an abstract element of theology. Christian friend, grab it with both hands Cling it to your chest. Because what does it mean? But you will never, ever, ever, ever face the anger of God at your sin. It means as long as you live and into eternity, not for a single moment will you know the personal holy indignation of God, of a righteous God at your wickedness. No, it is gone. It has been taken instead. Listen, because of Jesus Christ, you shall assuredly spiritually advance from this moment onwards. Don't you see? You will, in Christ, conquer sin. You will move on from AI. You will move on to inhabit the fullness of God's promised land of salvation. We learn here the devastating effects of sin. We should hate wickedness. 
But we also, we also see from what we have been saved, the wrath of God. What is there left to do? Come on. What is there left to do? But sing. He is the propitiation for our sins. Christ is the propitiation for our sins. What is there left to do? But to lift up our voices in songs of loudest praise. Friends, let's bow. Let's pray.